in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 50 he says now this I say brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God neither doth corruption inherit incorruption behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory O death where is thy sting O grave where is thy victory the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ therefore my beloved brethren be ye steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord you know now verse 58 is a good verse to have in mind as we begin a new year to, you know to be encouraged to be steadfast and unmovable and to know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord but what I want to talk with you about is that is the victory that's referred to in verse 57 in other words I, there, I believe there's a connection you know between what he says in verse 58 and verse 57 in other words why should we be steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord well it's because we've already been given the victory through Christ we're not we're not working to attain a, a victory we're not in a battle that we're expect, either going to be losers or victors that type of thing it's because of the fact that we we already we that believe or have been given a victory given the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ and so verse 58 begins with the word therefore because we have this victory and can claim in Christ therefore we're to be steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. So I want to talk about that victory and maybe its connection with some of the things that are spoken of there in the passage. Now, before we get into these things in detail, I want to compare something. I want you to compare something with me. I want you to go to uh, in the Psalms. Go to Psalm 98. <coughs> Psalm 98, back right in the middle of the Bible and Revelation 15 verse back there at the back <clears throat> Psalm 98 and Revelation 15 <clears throat> in Psalm 98 it's not a very long psalm, so I want to read the whole psalm and just read along with me. Psalm 98 from verse 1. He says, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And I might want to stop there just for a second and, and kind of clue you in about what we're reading about here. This is a millennial passage. This is looking forward into the millennium. In other words, after the rapture, after the tribulation, and once the Lord returns to destroy the enemies of Israel and save them from their enemies and establish His kingdom upon the earth, there will be, it, this will be a beginning of a time of celebration of victory. You understand? His victory. His right arm, it says. He got victory over the Lord's enemies. And he showed it in the sight of the heathen. Knows the nations are going to witness this great salvation of, of the nation Israel. And the nations that bless them will go into the millennium with them, you know. 
And, and so think about, you know, I, in my mind, I just hear all this jubilation, the sound of joy and whatever. Verse 4. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with a harp, with a harp and the voice of a psalm. With trumpets and sound of cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. I know you can, I mean, to me, I just hear all this joy and jubilation because the Lord has gotten the victory and he's come to judge the world in righteousness. There's not going to be any more perversion of judgment, you know, uh, wicked ruling and wicked taking advantage of the righteous and whatever. There's going to be righteousness in the world. And so this is a, there's going to be praise to the Lord who has gotten this victory. But you understand, that's not the one that Paul is talking about. He hadn't given us that victory. That, it's, it's a different thing. In fact, uh, look at Revelation 15. <clears throat> In Revelation 15, verse 1. He said, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. So you see that victory that we were reading about in Psalm 98. There's some people who are going to celebrate a victory as well because they would have gotten the victory over the beast. In other words, they would have come through the tribulation. They, they had got, uh, gotten a uh, victory over his image, over his mark, and the number of his name, you see. These are the people that have, uh, are going to go through the tribulation. But, you see, that's not laid out for us as any hope. Uh, our hope is based on the truth of the gospel that Christ died for us. In other words, Christ got the, got the victory on our behalf. There's a victory that he obtained that uh, by believing the gospel, we received by a gift. We, we, he, in fact, the word, if you remember there, 1 Corinthians 15, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's like, it's something that he earned and won, not over the enemies of Israel, uh, not over the mark of the beast and the number of his name, but rather based on another form of battle, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because I want to go into some of this detail there. But it was this victory that he obtained at Calvary that by the gospel, the good news that Christ died for our sins was buried and rose again. We can simply just accept, and he giveth us that victory. Now, we have it by faith. We're victorious in Christ. Uh, without going through the tribulation without uh, having to deny the Antichrist and deny the number of the beast and all that kind of thing. And just for clarity, maybe I need to put something on the board just right quick because where we are, we're in the, the time of the preaching of the gospel, the forming of the body of Christ. In other words, it's the gospel of Christ that has to do with this victory. Looks back to Christ's death at Calvary. It's different from the gospel of the kingdom that we find here in the Lord's earthly ministry, which looks forward to the Lord's return at, and, and to the establishment of the kingdom. We're looking to go out at the rapture and be delivered from this present evil world. And there will be those who will go through the tribulation and they'll have to get the victory over the, over the beast. But for us... 
We, do, we believe on Christ. Now, if we reject that truth, there won't be any victory to be had over there because God is going to send those who rejected that message. He's going to send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned to believe not the truth. So accepting the truth of the gospel of Christ is a responsibility that we have. We, we're, we're going to be held accountable for not trusting Him, having heard that He died for us, having heard of this victory. And so I want us to go into a little detail about it. One, before we get into it in, in full, I want you to look at the passage in Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians 2, uh, from verse uh, 10, <clears throat> Colossians 2, verse 10, he said, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised Him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses." blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That triumph there, verse 15, is the victory that's ours. It's that triumph, you see, that he obtained at the cross. And, and this, there's so much to this, I don't think we could really even deal with all of it because he refers there to the principalities and powers. You know that Psalm 22, which he quoted from the cross, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And, and evidently he look, he's looking around and in the psalm it says that the dogs have compassed me about. Strong bulls of Bashan. In other words, the, he's referring to the fallen angels, the principalities and powers, the, the devil himself, as it were like gathered together around the cross. And his enemies there, you see. Uh, uh, to, to get him to stop, to get him to give up, to, to uh, call upon the angels to save him and whatever. But he didn't. He endured it. He, be, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And he got the victory by dying, you see. He, uh, he, he didn't... Uh, and and, and it's, it's very fascinating, especially in the book of Luke. If you pay attention in the book of Luke... He sets his face to go to Jerusalem and he's constantly going. He, he, it's like, a, I think about a horse with blinders. He just, he's got that, he's determined and that's where he's going. You think about, see, without him realizing it even, Peter was an enemy at a certain spot in there because he told him, hey, I'm going up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed by the chief priests and elders and be killed and raised again. And Peter said, Not so, Lord. This should not be unto thee. It's to keep him from the cross. And so what did Peter say? Get thee behind me, Satan. You see, in that instance, Peter, Peter was not being led by the Spirit of God in what he said. He was being led by the devil. And so that's just an example, you see, of he, all those things he had to overcome. In the garden, you know, praying earnestly, that uh, to the, to the uh, extent that his sweat became dr drops of blood that were falling down to the ground. And he prayed, he said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He overcame all of that and endured the cross. And I, I, I just, uh, there's not time to tell it all. Of, a, of, of, of those things that he foresaw there in the garden. He knew that that his beard was going to be pulled out. He knew that he was going to be spit on and have his 
back uh, torn up with a whip so that the Greek was like a plow that somebody had plowed his back. He saw all of that and yet he didn't let that deter him. He endured and he won the victory and in in source he said his resurrection triumphed over them in it. And that's the victory that's given unto us that believe. Now, so we're going to look into some of the details just a little bit. Um, I want you right now to go to Romans chapter 3. Um, get Romans 3 and get Galatians chapter 3. Romans 3 and Galatians 3. In Romans 3, from verse 19, Romans 3 verse 19, he said, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so that's what the law is for, is to shut every mouth. Nobody can say, I've kept it. It's to prove that all are guilty. Verse 21, he says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So, uh, I'm, let me see if I... I I'm going to just kind of fill in some things here. So what we have on this side of the cross, that, 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 that He was victorious over, was sin and sins that were by the law. What's the law for? That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be form, be, become guilty before God. Uh, by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul wrote and said that for he became, was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. So the, the very fact that he quoted Psalm 22 and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? is because he was made to be our sin there. And as if we want to get a, a real good picture about what God thinks about us as natural born people, just get the picture of the cross and that's what he thinks of. In other words, that's what we deserve by virtue of how we're born. Not just what we do, which is the working out of that nature, but that sin that came by Adam, we didn't really have anything to do with. We're born in sin without asking for it. And it works itself out just like a disease. And so the law is given that we might become aware of it and see that that's the case. That, Like Paul said in Romans chapter 7, he said, I, I find a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. It's no more I that do it, that sin that dwelleth in me. And he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It's, it's that nature of sin and it's abhorrent, it's ugly, it's... It cannot dwell in God's presence. It has to be judged. And therefore God gave His Son to do just that. His, him who knew no sin became judged for our sin. And so it, and at the cross He became victorious over, that, over sin and the law so that we might be given that victory and believe and receive the righteousness that's by faith. 
In other words, we that trust Christ as our Savior are counted righteous. It's not something that's put inside of us so now we can do better than we did before. It's not a power to keep the, keep the commandment. We didn't have it before. I didn't have it before I believed and I don't have it now. Somebody said, well, you need to quit preaching. There's not a soul on earth that can say any differently. In other words, that's not, that's not how he's fixed it. He's fixed it so that we claim this by faith. It's put to our account. That's what walking by faith is all about. People don't have the foggiest idea about really what it is. It's about believing something that you can't really see or feel. I don't feel righteous. If I was honest with you, I feel like a worm most of the time. I feel like a scumbag. You know, but, but, that, but that's, not, that's just what I am in the flesh. But that's been judged. God said that that's been crucified. That's been judged. It's been put in the ground. So that when Christ rose from the dead, He rose a new creature. That's you that believe. And He says, put that on. In other words, walk every day knowing if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, then He counts you righteous. You're just as righteous as Christ. In other words, sin doesn't have any more dominion over you than it, did, than it does over Him now because He died that death that it called for. In other words, the, for the law and God to be righteous, all this has to be judged. Now, see, we can believe the gospel and, and allow Christ to have been judged on our place, you see, or we can take our chances at the you know, great white throne. Don't want to do that. In other words, that's the, the hope of the gospel. Uh, keep a finger there in Romans. Look in Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians 3, verse 10. Galatians 3, verse 10. He says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. Boy, if people could get a handle on that. The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. In other words, if you were going to, have to, uh, if you were going to try to be justified by the law, you'd have to live in that every day. And that wouldn't be faith at all. It's doing, not faith. Verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So, <clears throat> he got the victory over sin. He was cursed with the, by the law when he died. He rose from the dead. And he got the victory over the curse of the law. So you see, that's the victory that's been given us in Christ. So I, 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 sh I shouldn't be walking, you know, through life, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sinner, I've got sin inside of me. Well, that, I'm to re believe in that victory that Christ uh, obtained over it. And, you know, there's a thing that people never get the picture about either that, uh, and I'll tell you what, before I, I'm going to save that comment until we read this next passage. Go back to Romans and go to chapter 6. In Romans 6, uh, we'll, for now, we'll start from verse 6. Romans 6, verse 6. He says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ... We believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. 
Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, <clears throat> I, I, I've heard preachers use this example in the past, and you know, reckon is a mathematical word. You know, it's, it's like uh, if you reckon one plus one equals two, and two plus two equals four, and, and on it goes there, you know. That's, I'm reckoning, I'm counting. But you know, whether I feel like one plus one is two, or whether I feel like two plus two is four, doesn't change the fact that that's the way it is. You know, in other words, that, well, you're to reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. That doesn't mean that we don't have the temptations of sin every day. It doesn't mean that we don't have still the nature of sin inside of us and the workings of it in our members and the temptations of it in whatever that... When that's going away is either at the rapture or when we die, when we leave this body. But you're to count it dead. You're to reckon it to be so, whether it feels that way or not. In other words, you're to reckon that Christ has died for it, He has paid for it, that God has put them away, that the body of sin is be destroyed, and so that when He looks on us, He looks on us not even really here at all, but seated at the right hand of His Son. At His, own, at his right hand, His Son at His right hand in the heavenly places. We're to count that to be the case. And so if there is any power for us to live better than just following our nature, which I, this, the, the, the Lord didn't put this in the book so that we could sin without <coughs> conscience, you know, that we could just uh, be licentious. No, no, no. But if we, there is any such thing as, as power, it's this. It's knowing that, God is, that Christ has done this for me. And it's knowing that He loved me and He gave Himself for me. And so in that God, He rose from the dead. What does it say about His resurrection there? He said that, it, verse 10, it said, In that He died, He died unto sin once, but in that He liveth, He liveth unto God. So in other words, we're to live unto God. That's the idea. In other words, he died unto sin once in the life that he's now living. He's living unto, unto God. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. And it goes on to talk about some of the things there. Verse 12. He said, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. And he goes on there uh, in that same vein. But the victory was earned by him. And He's given it to us. And so sin should not have dominion over us. We're not under the law. It implies that if we were still under the law, that sin would have dominion over us, you understand. Not under the law, but under grace. We're to claim that victory by faith. Uh, go to... Uh, I want you to keep a finger there yet in Romans. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews 2, let's read from verse 9. <clears throat> Hebrews 2, verse 9. He said, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became Him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. 
Now verse 14 is where we're really after. Verse 14, he says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Well then, not only did he, was he victorious over sin in the law, but he was victorious over death, and I'm going to go ahead and put in here, that came by Adam. In other words, that death that passed upon all men, he tasted of, he took upon himself that he and was victorious over, rose from the dead. And there's a thing about this too I want to kind of get you to think about more. I, I think we tend to think so much about, because I guess we're on this side of the, of mortality, that we, we think about death only in the sense of drawing our last breath and you know, like we were talking about this, this morning, you know, that brother died or that... Well, they've, they've left this realm. But the death that passed upon all men, unless there's something done about that, <coughs> like it says later on in the book of Hebrews, it's appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment... You understand that there's such a thing as eternal death. There's death from which there's never any hope or resurrection. Never any or, uh, or immortality. Put it like that. Um, that and so uh, I believe there's a thing that the Lord himself experienced as we were just referring to that quotation out of Psalm 22. Where he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That he was forsaken by God the Father on the cross. Now, because he tasted of that death and rose from the dead, we can believe on him and receive the Spirit and face our leaving this world, if it comes to that, and never experience what he experienced on the cross. You understand what I mean? Separation from God. Now the person that goes to the deathbed without Christ will be to that person. I mean, think about I mean, having to face that and without the comfort of Christ, without the comfort of knowing that he's already uh, taken care of that death, that, that separation from God and knowing that uh, uh, in Christ that there is no separation. In other words, uh, uh, and uh, gosh, I couldn't help but think this morning, and y'all just bear with me about all this. I, I'm sorry, I, I guess I dwell on it a lot lately, but I just can't help but keep thinking about the, our members that have gone on. And the, the meeting up there is way bigger than the meeting down here. We, we, I mean, uh, uh, and I thought about that song, uh, who, uh, George Jones. Who's going to fill their shoes? Brother Moore used to like country music. and He, he talk, talked to me one night. We were coming back from Birmingham late at night. and that, he, was wanting to, he played a little bit of music. And it, he said, you know, Nolan, I think about preachers when I hear that song. You know, who's going to fill their shoes? Thinking about the old preachers of the, the past, and, you know. But I thought about that, you know, that about all the, that have, uh, and, and uh, I've spent my entire ministry just thinking, well, I, I'm, I want to be the one, one of those in the rapture. I want to be one of those that, like he referred to where we began, not, uh, we shall not all sleep. Some of us are going to be alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. And what a marvelous hope that is. Could be today. But the days go on and death still claims, in other words, the flesh but does not claim the soul of those that 
believed on the Lord. They leave and go to be with Christ. And they, they can face death without, without being separated from God, knowing that... In fact, uh, uh, look back at Romans. And uh, go to chapter 8. Romans 8. Uh, let's start from verse 32 there. <clears throat> Romans 8, verse 32. He said, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. There's another word that's associated with victory, a conqueror. Verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, I, I kind of skipped over a thought, and I want you to go back to chapter 5 in Romans, just briefly. <clears throat> and uh, a large part of this chapter is in parenthesis, and for this for this today, we're just going to skip over the parenthesis. We're going to go from verse 12 to verse 18. So, <clears throat> Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, that's the work of Christ, the righteous work that He did at the cross, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're on this side, you know, thinking about the, uh, the cross and the victory that Christ obtained over death that came by Adam. And as a result of that, we have eternal life in Christ as a gift. The righteousness of one. In other words, one man on one side disobeyed God. Adam disobeyed and death passed upon all men. And yet by one man's obedience, many were made righteous and <clears throat> grace reigned to eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see, even though... It's like we're talking about. Even though sin remains in our flesh, and we're still liable to death as long as we're in this flesh, it's not going to have the victory. Sin in my flesh has not got the victory. Christ got the victory over it. And God counts me righteous even though that's still there. And you know, I believe that part of this is so that the Lord left it this way that we might have a reward. In other words, like he talks about it in Galatians 5, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They're the contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you would. And what I believe he means by that is on both sides. It's like that I see good that I could do, 
and I don't do. But I also am tempted to do bad, and I don't do because I know it's wrong. And that, that is, I have the, the spirit in me that, that gives me that, you know, a, a capability to mortify. He says, mortify your members, which not all the time. It's, it's back and forth. All the time, every day. And, and I believe the Lord has fixed it that way because we, so that we might have a reward for putting up with all of that and serving Him anyway. And, you know, in other words, claiming by faith that this is true even though it doesn't feel this way at all. You know, He left it this way and that, that we might walk by faith. You know, uh, and besides that, you know what? If I believe that if, if, if God really did what pe some people say that He did, does and takes away you want to, <laughs> you wouldn't be very much of a testimony to His grace. How could you be a testimony to God's grace to a sinner if somehow or another all of a sudden now you're not a sinner and you have the power to live above sin and what well you know, that's just a, that's just hypocrisy you know that, that was not going to appeal to a, a, another sinner well I mean I, I'm I'm sorry I'm uh, you know I'm sorry I'm a sinner but I'm a saved sinner and so <laughs> that's the Paul said that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners he said of whom I'm chief. So we're all alike that way, you know. Uh, Paul, God didn't change his flesh, and he's not going to change ours either, you know. But he le he's left us with the knowledge and the, cap and, and the, the fact that we could claim this by faith. We know this, and it's, it's spiritual truth. Now, the last thing I want you to notice with me, go to Acts 13. Acts 13, and, and get 1 Corinthians 15 one more time, where we began. Acts 13 and 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> and so, in Acts 13, here's Paul's message in the synagogue, so when he began his ministry... And in Acts 13, he says from verse um, 32. <clears throat> Acts 13, verse 32. He said, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. So there was one other thing there on our behalf that Christ got the victory over, and he refers to it there. Corruption. And I'll just go ahead and put this in too. Mortality. And when you're young, you don't think about this so much. Josh, I don't know. I guess you might be your youngest one here. <laughs> but after the years start accumulating on, you know, start counting the birthdays and the fact of the deterioration of this mortal flesh becomes more and more a reality, you know. Uh, a tooth gets pulled, it don't grow back, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's corruption is what it is. 
In other words, Adam really pulled a, you know, boner. Uh, <laughs> sin entered by Adam. Death and corruption. But he whom God raised from the dead, he said, saw no corruption. Be it known unto you that whosoever believeth unto him is justified from all things. And the scriptures say that we're going to put on a body that's just like his. In other words, and so he referred there where we began. This mortal is going to put on immortality. And this corruptible is going to put on incorruption. And it's just like a set of clothes. If you think about it, the way it's spoken of. Uh, go, go to 1 Corinthians 15. Um, verse 42. Just kind of jumping in in the middle here. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first, which is, is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. That is so. In other words, where he obtained the victory over the corruption of our flesh and our mortality so that we might put on incorruption and immortality. And, I mean, it, uh, this, this takes, it takes it kind of to another level. I mean, we talk a good bit about this aspect of faith, you know, about Christ got the victory over sin and the law, and God counts us righteous by faith. He got the victory over the death that came by Adam, so that we have eternal life as a gift in Christ. And we have it, not because we feel like it, because God says we have it. We claim it by faith. But while we're walking around in this corruption, do we really walk around like we've already... And I personally believe this is the thought that Paul has in Philippians. I, I wasn't going to mention this, but I think I will now. We've got to go to Philippians. Chapter 3. In fact, before I read in chapter 3, uh, no, that's fine. Yeah, just look, start with me in chapter 3 from verse 8. Philippians 3, verse 8. He says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. And he's not talking about physical things. He's talking about things that he could boast in and brag out like it, about in religion. Verse 9, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. I, I don't think he means by verse 11 that he has any doubt of his own salvation. In other words, he knows that he's going to be with Christ. Uh, you know, there's no question about his salvation. 
I think what he has in mind when he says about if, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead is to make this fact such a reality to me by faith that I walk as if I was already raised from the dead. And those, as if all of these things have already become a reality. And that's really, I, I believe that's what he's talking about. I believe that's that aspect of faith, like, of, of, you know, so that I, I don't, I'm not walking, concentrating on all of this, even though it's still all a physical reality, you know. All of that's still a physical reality. But God says, this is what's real. This is what's by faith. This is the victory that He's given us. And so if I'm going to receive that victory, I'm going to have to concentrate on, these, on this side of the ledger, if you want to think of it that way. Christ died all to all of that once. And now He's living, and I live in Him, and we're to live unto God, and claim this as if it was a fact, I believe. I think that's the idea. Um, in fact, but before we leave Philippians, there's one other thing we want to go to. Down in Philippians 3, just while we're here, <coughs> verse 20. So he says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall, shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. So we're going to have that same incorruptible image, that spiritual body, just like His. Uh, I want you to go to 2 Timothy 1, and we'll probably stop with this. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy 1. <clears throat> he says from verse 7, he said, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us, and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Uh, now, for whatever it's worth, the word that's immortality in verse 10 it's, it's a little uh, unusual here, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to correct the King James Bible. I believe it's perfect, like, just right like it is. But, just, and, uh, but the word that's translated immortality there is the word that's translated other places in the King James Bible in corruption. So when he talks about bringing life and in corruption... Incorruptible immortality. In other words, it has to do with the, the thought of that incorruptible body. You understand? It's abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. In other words, how can we have incorruption, an incorruptible body? By the gospel. See? It's, and, 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 and I don't... You know, we started out with a couple of verses having to do with some people who are going to have to do something to have a victory in the tribulation. There isn't anything to do here. All the doing was done. He got the victory. The cross was the scene of a tremendous battle, a tremendous struggle that he won, became victorious. Thinking, and I'm no doubt the devil thought he'd gotten the victory himself when Christ said, uh, bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He said, it's finished. And lo and behold, come and find out that he had cut his own throat. In other words, he brought about his defeat by subjecting Christ to the death of the cross. Christ won the, he won the victory there over all of these things, over sin, the law, death, corruption, 
rose from the dead, and giveth, giveth us that victory just by faith. So we're to claim it and walk in it until God, he's through with us. And so that, therefore, he said in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, therefore be steadfast, unmovable. And so we have a basis for being steadfast and unmovable because of the victory that, of, uh, that he obtained. And you can have it just by believing on it. In other words, you just receive it. You don't have to do anything, go anywhere, say anything, pray anything. You just accept your own unworthiness, accept your own weakness and, and failure and incapability of ever pleasing God and knowing that Christ pleased Him, that Christ pleased the Lord, and He was pleased with us as we just turn it over to Him and believe in His work on our behalf. And He puts it to our account and He's never going to change His mind about it either. That's wonderful. That's what's fantastic. Is that if you trust Him, you'll be sealed with His Spirit until the day of redemption. And it's not the kind of thing you're going to go, you know, hallelujah, working miracles kind of thing. No, we have His Spirit that, and we know it because of the book. And He teaches us and He'll show us truth and we're sealed. And we'll have a testimony too, by the way. You know, that's like a seal... Is not so much about, you know, screwing a lid on a jar as it is putting a label on it to show what's inside. To show who it really, it's, it's ownership. The Lord uh, said that the foundation of God standeth sure having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. So if Christ is your Savior, you can tell somebody about it. You can acknowledge that He's your Savior. I belong to Him. 